live. So while we're um, presenting, you are able to unmute and ask questions later, turn your video on if you want to engage as we have the Q&A. Um, but we ask as we go through the presentation, if you would make sure to keep yourself muted so we have a really nice um, recording. While we're getting started, I am going to launch a quick poll just to make sure we have a good idea of who's in the audience today. So thanks for uh, taking just a minute to do that. So this roundtable is going to be a great experience. Uh, we're going to hear from a group of registrars um, to hear a little bit more about micro-credentials and the work they've done uh, with a uh, recent work group. Um, so as you're doing that poll question, um, feel free to use the chat throughout uh, the presentation today to share, your, share any questions or thoughts you have. This panel will um, be happy to kind of answer your questions and address your burning issues or questions that you may have. Um, so thanks for joining us today, and I'm just looking to see, I'm just waiting for you guys to complete your poll questions before we uh, jump into this. All right, while we do that, um, I may leave the poll up, but at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mark McConaughey from ACRO to give us a little bit more background on the work that we're going to share um, and then move into the Q&A. Mark. Okay, thank, thanks, Kelly. Um, just a quick reminder, this is, um, we have a little bit of a presentation to get started, um, but in fact, um, it is uh, even for me, and I, I have to give uh, Kelly, Christy, and Brenda just a, you know, a little bit of props for trusting me to get started, because, you know, I do have a tendency to uh, talk on and on and on, um, but the whole point of this is to, um, basically have a dialogue, not only about digital credentials, um, and particularly in higher education and the role of the registrar and all of the policies, practices, and pieces that are necessary in order to establish a good uh, digital record foundation. So with that in mind, the first thing I want to do is introduce my co-presenters. So let's start with Brenda. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brenda Schumann. I'm the Deputy University Registrar and Director of Operations and Compliance um, at UT Austin, and I had the opportunity to chair the ACRO working group uh, that developed this report. We worked closely with our ACRO colleagues across the nation. Great. Thank Hi, you. everybody. Thank you. I'm uh, Christy Wold McCormick. I am the Assistant Vice Provost and University Registrar at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I work closely with Brenda and the work group team on the um, writing this report. At the time, I was serving as the ACRO Board of Directors liaison to this work group, and um, it was really uh, interesting and um, exciting development in, uh, in our project, so we hope you enjoy it as well. Hi, and I'm Mark McConaughey. I'm a senior ACRO consultant and uh, the CLR coordinator uh, at ACRO. Actually, uh, before that, I was the associate vice provost and registrar at Indiana University in Bloomington, and I was also known sort of as the Brad Pitt of registrars. And then I know what you're saying to yourself. Oh, I know that Mark looks exactly like Brad Pitt, but what is a registrar? So. Let me tell you a real quick story. Uh, just a couple of years ago, I had to paint the house and, uh, you know, it was warm outside and I had to get it going. And I was setting up everything and I, had, you know, just just for the sake of getting ready to put on a sweatshirt and a jacket. And I was getting ready, starting ready to go up the ladder. My wife comes out and says, oh, Mark, good. I'm glad you're getting ready to paint the house. Hey, but um, why are you wearing a sweatshirt and a jacket? And I said, well, Kathleen. I'm a registrar, I read the directions, and it said to put on two coats. <laughs> I know you can't, I know <laughs> you can't see that, but I'm tying into the, uh, to the notion that registrars are all belt and suspenders people and that they're rigid and all of those things. Well, there's some truth to that, but actually I think you're gonna find that registrars do, do much more than that. So what are we talking about here? We're really talking about digital credentials, but of course, higher education has been in the business of granting and awarding credentials for a long, 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 long time. And as a matter of fact, this little simple diagram 
uh, basically shows the old, I think, typical path of maybe not digital credentials, but credentials, those things that degrees, certificates, transcripts, those things that traditionally come out of the higher education experience. Well, how does it start? Well, of course, there's the whole infrastructure surrounding uh, instruction and the curriculum. And of course, that's already in place. But once the student has mastered that, uh, and even along the way, uh, if they need to share that particular bit of information, their credential with someone, they typically, on their own initiative, go contact uh, the institution itself. The institution aggregates all of that information, puts together the, all of the pieces and processes in place in order to share it, and they share it to whoever the third party is. And this is an attestation of the work that the student has accomplished at the institution. And I think an important component of that is the word that's listed right there on the right-hand side, which is trust. If you think about sending a transcript, uh, particularly before the digital age, how did we ensure trust? And we did that with a signed and sealed envelope, right? You're assured that the, the um, uh, credential came in an envelope, that the envelope hasn't been opened, that it went through the United States Postal Service, and that it was un when it was opened, it was immutable and it was from the issuer. Those were the pieces of trust that were just very important. We've done that even more recently with digital credentials as well with PDFs. It isn't a signed and sealed envelope, but it's an encrypted PDF doing many of the same things that that signed and sealed envelope did. And this isn't the presentation we're getting into how that works, but to note that it does a couple of special things. One is you know if it's it's called tamper resistant. You know if it's been augmented or changed since the time it's been issued, and it has carries a digital signature, so you know that it come, emanates from the institution. Well, what are we talking about here? We're really talking about a whole set of alternate credentials. Um, ACRO, the, the, the organization I work for, has really been associated with the comprehensive learner record, um, but there are other types of digital and alternate credentials out there. As a matter of fact, um, Brenda and Christy will be talking more about that in a little bit. But the whole idea is we do more now than just that one set of credentials, um, all of which the, the old set of credentials was really under the auspice of the registrar. Now we're talking about experiential engaged learning, co-curricular learning, all of the things that could be expressed that have learning outcomes and can be mapped potentially to skills and competencies either at other higher education institutions or within the labor market itself. Well, I think the important point of what we're trying to get across here is that that really is the province of the registrar. That is the appropriate agent of the institution who assures the validity, the integrity, uh, who attests to is the officer in charge with attesting to these pieces and putting them out there on the student's behalf. But of course, what I still have up is the old model. The old model being the student requests it. Um, it's in, maybe it's in a digital form, maybe it's in a PDF form, which is sort of a digital paper form, maybe it's like that. But in fact, we wanna move beyond this to an ecosystem in which empowers the, the student, the learner themselves to not only you know, basically disclose this information to the recipient of their choice, but to, to some extent curate the, the sets of credentials they have to give them the best opportunity for the opportunity they're seeking. So that looks a bit like this, where in fact now what happens is the institutions here in a digital form send their credentials to the student the student has a number of these and notice they're atoms because they can collect them to create molecules uh, and then you can recombine them in, in appropriate ways and share them with the third party. But the whole important aspect of this is we still have to maintain the trust. So even though it's passed through the hands of the student and goes to the third party, we want those elements of trust to be sacred. So there's this pathway of trust. Now, Again, this particular uh, uh, talk today is not about the elements of digital trust. It's really about the role the registrar has 
in creating not only the regulated uh, um, credentials that you've grown accustomed to, but this, this whole set of alternate credentials. So what is it we're talking about? And why are we trying to put this together? Well, this whole thing on the left is really the traditional role. It's the traditional transcript, the set of degrees, certificates, and other components that we think of as official credentials of the institution. On the right-hand side, the right-hand column is the new set of alternate credentials. This was primarily made for a CLR, but it doesn't have to be limited to something like a CLR. These are co-curricular experiences, work experiences, internships, those things in which the institution says, these have learning and academic value, even if the experience themselves are living outside the classroom. There's a governance process, it's been assessed, we understand what's going on, and we, the institution, wish to attest to those things. So that's what happens here. There's a set of learning outcomes in a course or program. It's something that we've done. It's a very mature system of governance, a very, very mature system of expression. And basically, we have to do the same thing. If we're going to express these as a credential on the student's behalf, we want this to happen on this other side of the coin as well. And then once we get that far, basically, if we've gotten that far, we've built a framework around which these learning experiences integrate. And I will say what's up on the slide is a set of whole set of um, external frameworks, things you recognize like LEAP and NACE. However, think about it could be an internal framework as well much like we've put together degrees which have a framework. In other words, you need to take a set of courses that lead to ultimately to this degree in much the same way if we're going to award a specific competency, a CLR or other type of award, these kinds of learning experiences may also have a framework that's either defined by the institution or you've used an external source in order to put that into, in, into some sense. And then, Lastly, we have to integrate it into a system of record. Notice it doesn't say an SIS, a, a student information system. Yes, it would be great if the SIS included all of these, but it must be a system of record. And the, by that, I mean registrars. We, if we're going to, in fact, do um, uh, basically a test or award these credentials and assert them on the student's behalf to the outside world, we must keep records. We have to ensure their integrity we have to know what's occurred with these things. And that is going into the system of record, whether it comes from the left-hand side, very traditional, and we do this very, very well, or it comes from the right-hand side. And once we get this far, then we can assert them on the student's behalf. Again, we can do this in one of two ways, either as a summative, which is a summative manner, which is what you're really accustomed to, uh, degrees, transcripts, you know, this is, this is a summary of what the student has accomplished over those times or formative. What does the student need to, you know, where are they in the degree program? Where are they in the award program? Well, that parallel works exactly the same way in a CLR. And which officer of the institution is most associated with the left-hand side? Well, it's absolutely the registrar. Not that they've come up with all the governance, not that they are the academic kings or queens, no, what we do is support them in such a way that everything is valid. We've, we've basically said, oh, here are your set of policies. Here's your frameworks. We're going to organize them in such a way that they can be taught and we can record them and now we can attest to them. And I, I'm going to repeat myself, but this is exactly the same on the right-hand side, whether it be a CLR, badge, uh, whatever kind of digital credential, uh, the institution feels it can assert, that's what needs to happen. We need to have this kind of administrative infrastructure. So I, I say up there, it really is the registrar. So what is the role of the registrar? Um, and the one I always remember, and this, this goes way back to, and I'll say, it, uh, R. Gerald Pugh, who was my uh, first boss in, in the registrar world, and basically he defined it as the administrative proxy for the faculty. We really do serve the academic arm of the institution and the instructional mission. And how do we do that? Well, we put the policies that the faculty have put in place and 
we build practices and processes around them so that they can be implemented. We have to do it at scale and we have to do it in such a way that we validate those, those components as they're, they're sent in. So that's what we do. We're really the validity checkers and we enable things to happen at scale. You know, the faculty cannot go across a 30, 35,000 uh, student um, institution and basically manage all of these things themselves. And even better for the learner themselves, they cannot aggregate all of this information. That's again, what we do. We also ensure those are valid, that they are compliant with all kinds of things. Obviously, FERPA's what registrars are most associated with, but basically state, federal, and institutional policy. We ensure that all of these components are, um, are valid. Um, and we serve as the experts for this. And I think one of the last things to say, and I've said this multiple times, is we're the agent who basically attests to these things on behalf of the students. So the, the whole point of this slide is to say, if you're embarking upon an alternate credential uh, initiative, the registrar must be a key player. So recognizing this, um, what is ACRA? Of course, registrars are big, not only, but a very large component of um, the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers. And we've recognized basically since 2015 that the expansion of the traditional student record is something we truly have to pay attention to. We started out with what we called an extended transcript at that time and, and basically became, came under the moniker of the comprehensive learner record. And actually, if you broaden that, it's the, the learner and employment record uh, of which a CLR is a, is a primary component. But recognizing that there has to be this expansion of digital credentialing, what kinds of things do we at ACRO have to pay attention to? And the first one is increased adoption, the need to scale. Obviously, if, if this is just starting, we need to scale, we need to have further participants. And actually, more importantly, which leads right into number two, we need to be able to have a conversation. There needs to be an ability to exchange either among ourselves, higher education institutions, or in fact, be able to attest them in other business spaces like the labor market. So we need to be able to do that. So we need scale and we, and as a result, we need a, a set of standards. And, and the set of standards work in a couple of different ways. One is a digital standard. And you know, we all kinds of ways to talk about that. And in, in the whole world of transcripts, it, you, it's Speedy. And there's, Speedy's been around since 1989. So obviously not a new standard, but I will say one that has not been adopted at a, at, a, at a very high level. As a matter of fact, it's only, it's less than 20% of the institutions in the country actually exchange records in speedy. So we, we really need to improve that overall piece. And of course, we're here at One EdTech and they have a CLR standard, which will is basically, it can include at least some aspects of the speedy standard, but also encompasses all of those things that we talked about or will talk about with alternate credentials. Once you get to a point where you can digitally exchange these things, you also have to make sense of them. And this is basically semantic standards. And this is where frameworks come into play, uh, where if you can tie to these kinds of semantic frameworks, once you express a certain kind of credential, Others who are receiving them can begin to make sense of it and put that into their own context. This is a big topic too, course articulation for those of you in higher ed is nothing new. And it really is another aspect of doing those kinds of things. I leave it there, but just to say that it's important. And last but not least, I already mentioned that, you know, we've only had less than 20% adoption of digital, digital standard, particularly speedy. Well, the heavy, it's a heavy lift to get to some digital exchange standards. And we have to find a way, um, one of the examples, we have to find a way to make the adoption and expression of student records to be machine readable. And we have to make that um, affordable by all institutions just to get that started. Some of the rest of the 
will fall in place. One of the best examples, we're almost all producing PDF transcripts at this point. If we could pop that into an engine and basically parse all of the information out and then um, render it as one of these standards, wouldn't that be grand? And we would really ease that, you know, the, the gate. We would lower the, and open the gate so that everyone could participate. So that's one of the big things. Mitigating business model incentives. This is a really big one. Uh, many of us at institutions, I was among them at Indiana University, um, basically charge a transcript fee. When you charge a transcript fee, you're basically want more transcripts sold in order to increase your revenue. As we talked about in that last little um, graphic I showed, we basically started talking about student self-sovereignty. If we're giving it all to the student once, we're not getting multiple sales anymore, we're undermining our revenue. And that is a disincentive to doing the right thing and for building the overall equals, e e ecosystem. Um, you know, the other part of this we already talked about is it would be great if, if all of our systems of record started to accommodate this bigger, um, you know, this bigger CLR system, digital credential system. And last but not least, we know we need to get the, we, we need to start establishing governance uh, surrounding these digital credentials. So that's what we're doing. Now, at least those are the initiatives that we see we have to go after. So what are we doing? Well, for the first, for, for dealing with scale and trying to get um, uh, basically working CLRs out there, we, we did get a Gates, ground, a Gates Foundation, easy for you guys to say. Uh, for CLR and credit mobility, there's a couple of those going. Um, there's also um, oh, a couple of other pieces that we're working with with the uh, National Student Clearinghouse in order to provide foundational and and um, oh, um, decision-making kind of information. So you know what's going on with your students. Um, and in essence, there's another uh, grant going on in, in the uh, Texas area dealing with credit mobility and prior learning and how all of those might come together. I don't wanna go, I don't wanna take time to talk about those, but I could, I could do that if, if we had the time. Uh, one ed tech and ACRO, as well as some others, were important in bringing together a whole uh, set of groups associated with digital credentials and what might happen in the future. The whole point of this group was to share information, understand each other's initiatives, and find places where, in fact, uh, they might be sympathetic. In other words, we might be able to align our initiatives and make headway. Um, ACRO, uh, uh, taking the lead from, uh, well, I see I still have IMS there, it's one EdTech, uh, had also done an implementation guide to the CLR standard. And so we want to ease that burden on institutions in order to adopt these standards. And last, but certainly not least, and important for this discussion, is the alternate credentials work group that was headed by Christy and Brenda. So with that, I'm going to give it to Christy and, <laughs> Christy and Brenda, again, easy for you guys to say, um, and let them talk about the work group. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm going to kick it off and then hand it over to Brenda in a little while. Um, there are some links within this PowerPoint, but I think um, Kelly is also going to drop a link to the report into the chat. Um, as mentioned, um, we, thank you, um, as mentioned, we um, were part of a work group of ACRO members, Brenda and I, and uh, that did some research, interviews, reading, a lot of investigative um, kind of sleuthing in this really rapidly evolving space of alternative and micro-credentials and put together a best practice document for ACRO members. ACRO members, as mentioned, is primarily comprised of registrars, admissions officers, enrollment management professionals, but really is, so that was our lens when we put this together. But as, as Mark mentioned, I always explain to people that registrars sit at a kind of a confluence of data, technology, compliance, and student success. And I think this really touches on 
all of those things in some way, shape, or form. So uh, you can all download, access the, the report um, through the ACRA website. And so we're not going to go through and, and cover in detail every aspect of the report because we know you can read it yourself. There is an executive summary at the beginning of it. But Brenda and I will each just take a few minutes and kind of highlight a few of the sections of how we split the report up. And then we will use the rest of the um, time together this morning to answer your questions, have a discussion um, as, as time allows. So we really um, deliberated quite some time on how to break up the report and how to structure it. Um, it could take many different uh, uh, avenues, but ultimately we decided to look at alternative credentials and break it down into kind of what are they? Why do they exist and why might a campus enter the space? Who are the audiences impacted or engaged with micro-credentials? How, um, and this was a big part of the report, how um, is the best practice section of to get something started a micro-credential initiative on your campus? And then briefly kind of where they might be stored and when they should be um, issued to learners. So we'll, we'll just really briefly touch on all of these. Um, I just wanna to touch on alternative credentials. We use that instead of micro-credentials because alternative credentials is just a little, a slightly larger. We wanted to make sure we could mention and differentiate certificates from micro-credentials and badges because they are different for most campuses. Many of us have been issuing certificates for many years um, and most of those academic certificates go through a governance process. They're credit-based. They um, might be stackable into degree programs, but they, uh, we usually have policies around what an academic certificate is on our campuses and how it's different from a major, for example. So we wanted to make sure that we could differentiate that because I think a lot of um, maybe smaller certificate programs or things that aren't transcripted but are called certificates will lend themselves really well into micro-credential offerings. So real briefly, in the what section of the report that you will see, we talked about um, common definitions and standards for the different types of alternative credentials. We provided some definitions. There are lots of definitions out there, so ours aren't the be all end all, but it gives you kind of a, an idea of how what we're talking about when we talk about micro credentials and badges and certificates. But really this section of the report talked about kind of making sure that your institution clearly distinguishes and delineates those different credential types. So your faculty understand, your students understand, any other learner, learners that you're serving understand um, what those differences are. Because we find people sometimes, just like on our campuses, we find hear people talking about majors and degrees interchangeably. Well, yeah, in, in common kind of casual conversation that makes sense, but we know there is a literal, literal difference between those things. So that was really kind of that section. We also wanted to talk about how these things could be stacked. And stacking is important because that's a really, that can be a very important way to get people into the door who might not be able to commit to a longer degree program or a certificate program, but they wanna dip their toe in and see. So just like certificates could be stackable into degree programs, if they are credit-based, we mentioned how micro-credentials could be stackable into say certificates, which, so it's really kind of the scaling model. We also spent some time in the report, this section of the report talking about as registrars, we are so trained classically to think about credit-based, academic-based offerings and credentials. And while we do believe, and we know that a lot of micro-credentials and badges will be credit-based, we are also seeing in these early years a lot of interest about from non-credit based learning that happens. We all know that learning takes place on our campuses in many shapes and forms to many different types of learners. And we didn't want to exclude that because that is a really important part of micro-credential initiatives. How that plays out into your SIS and your academic transcript is going to be a little bit different if things are credit based or non-credit based. Traditionally, the transcript is very, um, the academic record, kind of that the holy you know document that explains everything that was earned academically. But as Mark alluded to with the CLR, 
that is a nice holding place for other types of learning that can happen as well as expanding upon the academic credentials. So that's really that section of the report. Uh, the next section on why, um, we really wanted to make sure that campuses that are thinking about entering the space or just beginning to enter the space understand kind of what are their goals with offering micro-credentials specifically. So I'll, I mean, I'll probably be using the word micro-credential more while we talked about both in the report. It's largely focused on the micro-credentials and badges. So with the why, what is your reason for doing it? You know, what is your mission? How does this fit? Are you doing it just because other institutions are doing it? Is there a real interest from the faculty? How does it align with all of your other institutional priorities? So will they help expand your campus brand? Will they help, you know, bring in different learner populations in bigger markets? Is there some value add to your current students to have these additional credentials added to their portfolio of learning when they leave your institution? Um, again, what is the interest level? So I think you'll, you're going to find that you have a lot of really innovative early adopters in this space that uh, you want to please, but you also want to make sure you have a good reason for moving forward. So again, not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but that's really the purpose for that section. And the last section that I will address before handing it over to Brenda is the who. We broke this into the who are the campus stakeholders that need to be involved, you know, engaging your obviously the registrars, the admission folks, the career services people, IT, human resources, um, your budget folks. Budget is a part that we, uh, we address quite a bit in here. Um, so really, who are all the different stakeholders? And as you bring together people who might be interested to really build a successful program, you find that that group is actually quite vast and represent different areas because you want to make sure it's inclusive and that you are covering all the bases when you're um, establishing an initiative on your campus. The credential providers, primarily who are the people on your campus who are authorized, able to develop and offer micro-credential programs. So again, I think it's a no-brainer. Faculty are one huge audience. They might be doing some really innovative things, whether it's credit-based or non-credit-based. And But again, you might have other entities such as human resources or IT or student affairs who want to also be able to capture and credential some of the non-credit-based learning that they're doing. I can tell you on our campus, academic departments can issue both credit-based and non-credit-based micro-credentials. Non-academic departments obviously can only issue non-credit-based micro-credentials, but there are some partnership opp opportunities that could happen between there. So it really brings in everybody on your campus potentially, but that's up to you and how you set up your program and what parameters you build. Finally, the various learner populations. You'll hear when we talk about micro-credentials, different than other types of credentials, we use the word learner more than student. And that's because not all people who will pursue these, depending again on your rules and your policies, will be matriculated students. So learners is a much more broad, inclusive term if you are reaching out to members in the community to offer some learning opportunities. If you're developing corporate partnerships, those might not be matriculated students, but they will be learners of your products. And so we really wanted to expand that. And so that is that section of the report that you can read a little bit more about. I am going to turn it over to Brenda to address the how, where, and when. Awesome, thanks, Christy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll jump right into the how section. So the how section is what I would refer to more so as the boots on the ground. Uh, so we've talked about the why your campus is doing it, uh, in implementing these alternative credentials, what they are, and who you're looking to target. But the how is really um, how do you go about implementing it? And one thing that the report, in my opinion, uh, does a really good job of, it's, it's prescriptive in the sense of it provides guidance and best practices, but realizing that each of our campuses is different and each of our campuses may approach things differently. Um, and our governance structures may be different. It, it provides what I would consider food for thought for a campus to consider. Uh, so in the house section talks a lot about that faculty governance and that's gonna look different on each campus. And as Christy mentioned, you know, if it's a four credits or um, micro-credential, alternative credential, 
versus a not for credit, that governance structure may be differently, may, may be handled differently. Um, but at the end of the day, um, there are considerations and we provide best practices for a campus to consider uh, when they're implementing related, related to the governance structures. You know, faculty need to be involved. How does it fit? It goes back to the what that stacking, does it stack towards this? Does it stack towards that? Do you have a, you know, a non-credit that you're working for credit? It, it poses all those types of things that a campus should consider. Um, in addition, it also talks about those campus partnerships, um, you know, working with the IT and developing standards, that governance of um, how are we establishing processes and policies? Are there new policies that need to be developed? How are we determining the identity of the person who is, of the learner who is obtaining or working toward this credential? Um, are there new policies related to these these folks who may not you be considered students on your campus related to FERPA, how does that all play into account? And it, it provides guidance in terms of these are the types of questions you should be asking that leaves the wiggle room knowing that each of our campuses may be different. Like at my campus, we don't consider someone a student unless they have applied through the Office of Admissions, registered for classes and paid their bills. That's a different standard on different campuses. Uh, so it raises those questions that a campus would need to consider in the implementation of these credentials. Um, we also talk a lot in the report about the standardization, and this gets into the, the IMS Global uh, standards of standardization so that they can be transferable because the benefit to the student, right, is that they can transfer them among platforms that they, like Mark mentioned, they can um, you know, present these credentials in a way that helps them get a job different than a transcript, because these are different than a transcript. Um, how can we best present those? And that goes back to the, the standards um, that we follow, that we implement. And we know there's a, you know, a plethora of companies out there that have these platforms, but the, the bottom line is we want to make sure that they're transferable and useful for a student so they can be transferred. Um, and then we also talked a lot about the standardization and badge design within your campus. Uh, so that what is, is there a consistent look and feel? You know, how is it branded? You know, is it your College of Liberal Arts different than natural sciences? How is that approach? And then the marketing piece of that goes back to the, the who of who you're trying to target. Are they current students? Are they learn, you know, people out of the world? What are they? But at the bottom, at the end of the day, you want them to look similar. You want them to have the branding and the identity of the institution behind it. Uh, so the how also provides some examples of different badge types um, from some of our ACRO colleagues across, across the country of how they have them established, the metadata, kind of the guts of those badges, what they look like, how they standardize them and how they look different at each of those institutions. Uh, so that's kind of at a high level of what the how section. I'll just briefly touch on the where's and the wins. Uh, the where section was identifying the places where the micro credential and badges should be um, shared. Um, and this goes back to what Mark was talking about earlier about, you know, is it in the SIS? What's the foot on the rock? Where is this information stored? How do we as campuses, how do we as registrars stand behind that information? What is that relationship with the comprehensive learner record? Um, where does it make sense? And each campus may look a little bit differently, but it provides some, some food for thought. The report will provide some food for thought for campuses to consider when they're identifying where these micro credentials and digital badges should be displayed, keeping in mind that trust, that immutability, that I can't word that micro, Mark always likes to use, um, that whoever is receiving that badge or micro credential at the end of the day, um, you know, realizes that it's an accurate and um, correct credential that the student is presenting. Um, and then the last section of the report talks about the win. Um, and we recognize in the report, obviously, some of the credentials may make sense to be awarded at time of completion, whereas some makes make sense to be awarded at time of degree. So it really poses some questions for the institution to consider of, you know, what is the best, what makes most sense to the learner, or what makes what's going to be most beneficial to the learner in terms of when the, the credential would be awarded. Um, the other consideration is what is the impact potentially to financial aid and to veterans benefits 
and things along those lines. Um, and, you know, in some instances, it may make sense. You think about the world we've lived in, you know, if someone was earning a badge and something pandemic related, you want to award it, be able to award it right then so they can go out and do good work. Um, but your institutional governance, institutional processes may not support that. So what sort of modifications and tweaks may need to be um, adopted to award the credentials at a time frame in which the learner may need them um, and may, be, may need most relevant to their work. So at a high level, those are the reports. It's a, it's a long report, but hopefully you'll find it beneficial. At the back of the report, we also pro provide a lot of um, references um, that you can read more about it, um, reference to um, other institutions, about things that um, other colleagues across the nation have reported. Uh, so we'll hopefully you'll take a look at that and um, can follow up with any questions you may have. So I think with that, Kelly, Mark, I think we were gonna open it up to some Q&A. Yeah, we've got a few that have come in through the chat, so I'll start with those. Um, if you have others, please feel free to add those. Um, we do have some other questions we can do. Um, one that kind of keeps coming up is what about the learning outside of the academic areas? So whether it's um, non-credit to credit, is that included in your recommendations or have you thought about how to address that as well as what about some of the learning that happens um, maybe outside that hasn't been assessed by your institution. So maybe it's an outside activity. Is there an opportunity for them to bring that in to be recognized in your institution? I was going to mention that there's also um, at the back of the report, we, we briefly talk about some future opportunities that we know are still developing and maybe are outside of the original scope of the registrar lens, but that will certainly engage. And some of those include um, some of this where, where we talk about, you know, opportunities for prior learning. I think a lot of campuses will look at, well, we we have pretty strict rules, you know, governed by the faculty on what, what awards a credit. So we just can't be saying we're going to just give anything off the street a credit. But if it goes through the right kind of process and evaluation, there are opportunities there, likely in that form of prior learning. Um, we also talked about, just real quickly, in that future opportunities, the role that we know that accrediting bodies and the Department of Ed is starting to get interested into this. So we wanted to get out with this report so that we could hopefully partner before any decisions or, you know, mandates come down without kind of our, our lens. Um, and then, you know, the top technology in the future that we didn't get into in too much detail, but things, you know, with blockchain and others that, that we want to make sure that... Um, we recognize are part of those future discussions, as well as the global recognition internationally. But to, the, to that question, I would say, yes, those opportunities will exist, but we need to have some very structured processes for evaluation to make sure that the academic integrity is maintained, because that's really important to our missions, to our accreditation, and to our faculty governance. And I think related to that, it's the, you know, the student learning outcomes and the faculty governance piece of it um, and the involvement of faculty in it. And I think in the, I can't remember which section it was, the, the what section, the stackability. So maybe you have those non-credit activities that stack towards something credit, but you have to have that assessment along the way. And how does all that play in together? Um, but at the end of the day, like Christy mentioned, it goes back to faculty and oversight because they're determining the credit. Um, and what's their involvement in that process. Right, and just to summarize that real quickly, you know, there really are two sides of this coin. If you, if you have learning that's occurring outside the classroom, even in a non-credit situation, to what extent are the governance of the institution and the willingness of the institution to express those as a credential? That's all one side, and that's really where I was focusing. The other side is how to bring it all in, you know? How does, it, how does it map to the existing context within that institution? And that's where these, these uh, semantic standards come into play. Because in fact, some of these skills, competencies, and learning outcomes may in fact find their way into even existing curriculum for credit. But unless you find this semantic way of doing it, there's no way of sort of performing the analysis. So the beauty of this is once we can get them out there, all of a sudden there's an inventory for us to analyze and to start taking into account. By the way, some of these are good, whether or not they're brought in for credit or not, some of these find value in the market, in the labor marketplace. So I think, I think this is, 
the way the way kids would say it now it's all good um and there's a question about the digital ledger blockchain technologies being considered for this work um i might start with that answer um so one edtech has our open badge and comprehensive learner record standards both of those are currently in revision to support uh, being able to support verifiable credentials that the w3c work so yes that kind of technology is being considered i think as a larger in this whole micro credentials ecosystem both uh in higher ed as well on the employer side and those outside um, people who are issuing that kind of work so i think it's it's being considered it's still early um but it is there all right um one thing i think is a question is like so what's the difference between a badge a micro credential a certificate a clr how do you as a kind of group start to semi define these well we do take some time to provide a pretty robust definitions um, section of this report so that's one place to start but again our definitions aren't like i said at the top of this uh, you know the be all end all definitions but i think they're they're pretty good definitions and on our campus one thing that we've really started kind of using as one of our little mantras so to speak is that a badge is to a micro credential what a diploma is to a degree program so we think of like the badge is really the artifact the badge contains the metadata and we get into some of that in this report too what is the badge and what should be contained in the badge but that is the artifact that is awarded or issued to the student upon successful completion of whatever the requirements are for the micro credential that they were pursuing just like a diploma is issued when somebody satisfactorily completes all the repro programs for a degree program micro credentials are just mini versions of you know certificates are smaller than degree programs micro credentials are usually smaller than a certificate um, and for that reason i think the devil's in the details and this is like to me quite honestly one of the things that campuses are probably going to struggle with the most is they're they're easier to spin up the shelf life might be shorter on them so it's maintaining a current kind of inventory and catalog of what are your viable micro credential programs and making sure that if students are pursuing them and the person who's in charge of them leaves like what happens you know degree programs have all these safety nets built around them so we want to make sure that we think about all those kind of details too as we're delivering these but um and then a certificate program is usually defined on some campuses i can't speak for all but you know a minimum of say like 12 credits in an academic area that's a subset of a discipline or sometimes they're interdisciplinary maybe there's not a major offered in something but you're bringing in some business courses with some communication courses and there's a certificate program that is you know very specialized from an interdisciplinary standpoint you know that just to pile on to what uh christy said that's why you need registrars you need to be able to maintain this system of records so that you understand what happened. If you awarded certain kinds of credentials, you need to understand the underpinnings of how it's recorded and how it's attested. And 10 years from now, you need to be able to come back and, and find it. So that's what's, that's what's important. Um, you know, the other thing I'd say, and I always like to say this too, what's, you know, there are micro-credentials and I, I love what Christy said. Um, and then there's a CLR. Well, what's a CLR? Think of the CLR as the transcript of micro-credentials. In other words, it's a way to organize all of these achievements that a student has accomplished and not only express them, but express the association between them. So I think that's, that's an important distinction as well. I think another important distinction that we talk about in the report um, is badges are different than degrees in the sense that they may have an expiration date, right? So if you have a degree, you have a degree forever and you may have that badge forever, but that badge shelf life, like Christy mentioned, may expire, meaning it's something you learned for something for a specific skill or job or whatever, and it may no longer be relevant in five to 10 years. So in part of the governance that we talk about is does this, this badge, have some sort of expiration to it, which is different than historically what we've talked about in higher education. But as registrars, it's something we still need to keep track of, meaning even though it's expired, we still need to keep track of that this person got this thing, even though the technology or whatever they learned may not no longer be relevant as the world changes. 
Do you have any recommendations around change management or onboarding and training for faculty and learners related to digital credentialing? I can, um, so I'll just talk about my experience at UT Austin. So we're a very decentralized campus. We're a large campus, 52,000 students. Um, so what we actually have a, a group of badge, what is it, badging practice group, I can't remember the actual name of it, but it's folks around campus who came together, um, and it's, it's not mandated by our campus that folks have to participate in this group, um, but it's encouraged, and they're trying to get standardization around the display and what they look like and the data elements, the metadata and all that kind of stuff. But our instructional technology folks actually developed a badge on badging so that if like training of if you go through this training, then you get a badge on how to get how to implement a badge is what we did. Um, and if anyone's interested, I'm sure they'd be happy to share that information or that training with folks as well. I love that badge on badging, just like we have a policy on policies and a committee on committees. But um, <laughs> but I think very, very similar to UT Austin at CU Boulder, we we have a micro-credential advisory committee, fondly, fondly called the MAC, and it's comprised of representatives, academic and, and uh, student affairs and, and, and administrative from across campus. And I know it has been expressed by some, say, associate deans, like our faculty are gonna wonder where they're gonna get resources and time to develop these. And, and our what we're trying to explain back is that if a dean makes this a priority or a department chair makes this a priority for their faculty, they have to kind of work that out to make sure that the, their, their faculty have the resources and the time and the bandwidth to do this. It is not a university expectation that faculty develop these. But one of the things that we've been saying on our campus too, and I, I, I touched on this earlier, is that there is all, so we are going to have innovators who have ideas that want to do, create some new things in this space. But we are doing so much already on this campus by way of learning that is not getting properly credentialed in a way that is verifiable or is useful to a learner or student that it would be if there was a credential that they could share with an employer or a graduate school or somebody like that. So sometimes it's a matter of what are you already doing that is badge worthy that we can just with a little finessing and a little bundling make it a micro credential and promote it and give it a little bit more structure so that the people who go through this have something a little bit more tangible to share with those that they're um, wanting to impress with it. And again, just piling on, start with where your institution is. You know, it doesn't have to be a great big uh, new initiative with a whole new governance structure. Start with the set of initiatives they already have and basically take advantage of the governance structures you already have. That's, that's what we did at Indiana. All great tips. So the questions are starting to come in. So do you anticipate that CEUs or CMEs will be a part of this process? There are some professions that have levels where the continuing education could contribute to moving up their rank. I think that's a perfect example of something that's non-credit based right now that could be some campuses have non-credit or transcripts already that they record these types of um, learning you know, activities that happen. Um, but I think anything that where you have traditionally like printed off a, a paper certificate for a student to show that they've completed a, a program or a, a set of learning um, requirements you could look to see, you know, does it does it meet the standards and criteria for a, a being a micro credential program that is badged? And in our report, we talk about we show some sample forms of questions you can ask, like what does the proposal process and the review and approval process look like um, for your micro credential offerings on your campus? And so those are some of the types of things that you could um, ask in that. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes back to even the earlier conversation. You don't have to create new. You can just think of what you're already doing in ways that you can improve the, the issuing of those credentials. We have just a few minutes left. Um, I think it's kind of important that we have three registrars on the call. So I want to take an opportunity to say, why is it so important to include this, this type of role as you go through this process? I'll kick it off and then I'll let the other two chime in just really quickly. One of my other, we've got we've got a few mantras as we say, or, or the lines that we keep using over and over at CU Boulder and they've kind of caught on is that, um, I think it's really important to include a registrar because at the end of the day, this is a verifiable, um, a portable 
credential that bears your institutional name and brand. And you want it to have the integrity, you want it to have the validity, you want it to have the meaningfulness that your other credentials offer. And if you don't have somebody central like the registrar primarily um, helping coordinate these efforts, you will have a much more decentralized kind of rogue process with probably lots of different types of standards and ways that badges are going on. And when somebody down the road wants to have that verified, um, and if you don't have a centralized place for that, like your other credentials, it could potentially be problematic or questionable for those that are um, that you're trying to share these with. Uh, it feels like all I do is pile onto what Christy and Brenda say, but just the mantra we always have is validity, integrity, identity, and authority. And those are all the auspice of the Office of the Registrar in terms of record keeping and things that are expressed on the students and faculty's behalf. So if you keep those things in mind, that is why the Registrar is so important for this overall process. And, and just to add to that, uh, I mean, the, the reason why I think all of us are in the registrar space is we want to make a difference, right? Um, and we want to do what's best for our students and for learners. Um, and I think the registrar is so critical and core to the university. We impact every student all the time. And if it's the course schedule, if it's registration, or if it's degrees, whatever it is. And because we're so central and critical and core, we have to be involved in the conversation, and we can, but we can't do it alone. Um, and the report does a really good job of recognizing all the, the campus-wide folks, the financial aid, the admissions, the IT, the institutional reporting, the budget, the, the upper administration, the faculty. It's really everyone across campus, but the registrar, because of our critical core centralization role on campus, uh, we just need to be involved with it and help coordinate and can help uh, facilitate the implementation. And let me just say, you know, you guys know that over the weekend, the movie Nope came out and many people associate registrars with just such an expression. I would say we need to make a movie with Brad Pitt uh, and it would be called Yet with Integrity. I love it. All right, thank you all. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things as we close out. I will follow up with everybody who's registered with a copy of the recording as well as all of the links that were shared and resources. Uh, we will have our next Digital Credentials Roundtable in September. We won't be having one in August just with all the back to school things. So information about that will be posted soon. I also shared in the chat the Badge Summit that Christie's campus at CU Boulder is hosting um, in August. The virtual registration is still available. So if you're interested in participating in that, that link is there. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. Um, we appreciate the insights you've shared and I appreciate all of the attendees who've come. So thank you very much.